We're uh, starting a new series. I did, when I was doing Brotherhood, I did a couple of studies in Nehemiah and, and felt like I wanted to go through most of the book. So that's what we'll be doing for a few months. So I hope you're patient with me. What I'd like to do tonight, Nehemiah and the story of the Bible. I've kind of for a long time had the conviction that it's a healthy thing for Christians to be able to explain to someone, this is a big book. An awful lot happens in it. And for people who claim to believe what we believe about what we call the Word of God, I think it's good for us to be able to share with people, here's the storyline. Here's what's, here's what's going on in this big book. And I think it's particularly relevant right at the beginning of this series on Nehemiah because the, the events of Nehemiah's life don't just happen. They fit in a very important way into a story, into the story of the Bible. And so I thought what I'd do, we'll see if we finish this whole thing. I want to take about the first 10 minutes, maybe 12, 13 minutes, going over the story of the Bible before we launch into, and that's how this relates to Nehemiah. Okay, so everybody understand kind of where we are, what we're doing? I'm doing this so that later on in the evening when I say point number one, you don't all have a heart attack because we'll be covering a long, long introduction in a shorter kind of teaching. Here we go. About 2200 BC, God calls a person, you know his name, God calls Abraham. Out of the blue, tells him to leave his people, his home, and to step out in faithful obedience to the Lord. God's going to do something special with Abraham. Abraham didn't deserve it. It's just his faith, his trust in God. God is going to create a people out of Abraham. And out of that people, he's going to raise a deliverer, the Messiah. That's God's main plan with Abraham. God calls Abraham, and with that call, he launches visibly his rescue plan for fallen mankind. You know the story. Abraham has son. Abraham and, and Jacob. Everybody knows about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. People that don't know anything else know about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 1950 B.C., roughly, Jacob has 12 sons. These will become basically the foundation for the 12 tribes of Israel. God's plan for establishing a people starting to come into focus. At the end of Abraham's life, God tells him that his people are going to go down into Egyptian captivity. That's one of the last things Abraham hears. And around 1900 BC, Israel enters 425 years of Egyptian captivity. The nation grows from, do you know how many people enter the land? About 70. Go into Egyptian captivity. They will grow to around 2 million. While that 425 years goes by, and that kind of growth is what prompts Pharaoh, remember this story, to order the extermination of each male child born. There's too many of them. And so that's the threat. Amram and Jochebed have a son. Moses, and they don't want him killed. You know the story. They place little baby Moses in that reed basket. Moses is found, long story short, and raised in the aristocracy of Egyptian society. Events go by about 1450 BC. God uses Moses to lead Israel out of Egypt, and he demonstrates his power he sends plagues on Egypt. 
Most of the plagues that fall on Egypt don't fall on God's people, most of them, except the last one. And God demonstrates his power by parting the Red Sea. You know those stories, and out go Moses and the children of Israel. Moses dies, not entering the promised land, struck the rock instead of speaking to the rock. Remember the story. Joshua. God raises up Joshua. Joshua will lead Israel into the promised land. They're not there very long. The people want a king. They want a king like the surrounding nations. And so the era of the kings begins with the first king, whose name is Saul. Eventually, Saul is told by Samuel, number of failures along the way for Saul. The prophet Samuel tells him that his kingdom is going to be torn from his hand and is going to be split in two. And around 1000 BC, the age of the kings over a united Israel comes to a close with David and then Solomon. 950 BC, Solomon's son Rehoboam comes to the throne. And as prophesied, the kingdom splits between north and south. The northern kingdom of Israel with the capital of Samaria, the southern kingdom of Judah with the capital of Jerusalem. Jeroboam rules over Israel causes Israel to sin. That phrase is repeated over and over about Jeroboam because he sets up an idol for the people to worship in Israel because he doesn't want them going down to Jerusalem. That's the beginning of all sorts of failures. And here's what happens. And now we're getting close. 723 BC, the northern kingdom Israel taken captive by Assyria. 600 BC, 125 years or so later, the southern kingdom, Judah, taken captive by Babylon, all predicted. This is what God said is going to happen. Now some interesting stuff starts to take place. 522 BC, about 75 years later, King Darius of the Persian Empire takes Babylon captive. This is the stuff, remember, of Daniel's dreams while Judah was still held under Babylonian captivity. Persia becomes the dominant world power. King Darius is succeeded by King Cyrus, and you should remember that. Because significantly, Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah, prophesied many, many years earlier that God would raise up a man to deliver his people, and the prophet Isaiah names and says, this person will be Cyrus. It's one of those amazing prophecies. It's in Isaiah 44, 24 to 28. Thus says the Lord, your Redeemer, who formed you from the womb. I am the Lord who made all things, who alone stretched out the heavens, who spread out the earth by myself, who frustrates the signs of liars and makes fools of diviners, who turns wise men back and makes their knowledge foolish, who confirms the word of his servant, who fulfills the counsel of his messenger, who says of Jerusalem, okay, capital of the southern kingdom of Judah, she shall be inhabited, and of the cities of Judah, they shall be built. I will raise up their ruins. Nehemiah is going to be involved in this. Who says to the deep, be dry, I dry up your rivers. Who says of Cyrus, names him. He is my shepherd and he shall fulfill my purpose. Saying of Jerusalem, she shall be built and of your temple, your foundation shall be laid. Cyrus isn't a believer in any way, shape or form. He's a godless man with an idolatrous religion and God says, I'm using you to do what I want you to do. Amazing stuff. So, 521 B.C., Cyrus agrees to let Zerubbabel take 50,000 Jews out of captivity back down to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. Unheard of that a godless king would do that. 470 B.C., Ezra leads another group down to finish the task of rebuilding the temple. 445 B.C., Nehemiah. Nehemiah 
goes down to rebuild the walls all around Jerusalem and all around the temple. And there's your Bible up to the point of Nehemiah. I wanted you to see the kind of situation into which Nehemiah enters. Because the idea in this study is rebuilding, how to rebuild, rebuilding our lives. And Nehemiah enters a situation with nothing but rubble. The walls are broken. There's nothing put up to protect the people. The walls represent security, defense, the structures that support and define the shape of the whole city. They were broken down. They were a mess. They were all in rubble. The walls, in a way we probably can't relate to right now, represented strength. They gave the city its future. So how do you go about rebuilding things that are rubble? How can Nehemiah succeed where other people failed? Those are pretty good questions, pretty important questions. Because look, look, at, look at the world in which we live. You just can't deny it. It's marked by brokenness, broken homes, broken promises, broken dreams, broken values, broken morals, broken systems. I mean, you can cut it any way you like. Much of life today has to do with learning to, to uh, rebuild things. Very few of us get to live our lives by our first choices all the time. We know what disappointment is. We know what it is to cope with things that don't go exactly the way we'd like. So, enter Nehemiah. How will he rebuild? How can the future be made secure when everything seemed to be so broken and so little to work with? And now, like I said, point number one, let's look at what Nehemiah does. You all still okay? The first step in rebuilding is pushing back the resistance to ongoing prayer. Let's see how far we get with this study tonight. Nehemiah 1, 1 to 4. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. The reason the Bible does that, by the way, is to emphasize to all of us that this is a historic account. It's not once upon a time a man named Nehemiah. Here's Nehemiah. He was the son of this person who was related to this person, and here's the date when it happened. So the writer intends for us to say, this happened just like this. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah. Now it happened in the month of Chislev in the 20th year. I was in Susa, the capital, that Han and I, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah. So they come back from Judah. I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning Jerusalem. Nehemiah wants to know. And they said to me, here's the report. The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down. Its gates are destroyed by fire. And, and then Nehemiah. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned. For days, we're going to see how many days in a minute. And I continued fasting, continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Note especially those last sentences. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. It's tough praying, tough praying. Praying in brokenness requires a, a commitment to prayer with very little emotional fuel. This is, this, is, this is prayer without Hillsong. 
This is prayer without any background. This is prayer without any encouragement. It's prayer with very little feeling of blessing in it. At least at first. This praying is, is mourning before God. There's no lightness in it, but it's still pleasing to God. I like that. You, you don't, depending on your circumstances when you go to God, listen to me, church, you don't have to fake being blessed if you don't feel blessed. You really can't fool him anyway. The first step must have been difficult for Nehemiah because as you read this book, you'll see something of his character. And what you'll see about Nehemiah is he's a man of action. He makes decisions. He commands armies and workforces. He lines up details. He's sharp. He's aggressive. He likes to move and get things done. Now look at that, first, that fourth verse again. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days. And I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. There's no delight in that prayer. Prayer feels more effective when we feel blessed. But sometimes prayer is most effective when it simply reflects the circumstances that birth it. Here's the lesson here. Here's what we learned from Nehemiah. You can't solve the real problem until you feel the weight of that problem. The first step isn't to rebuild the wall. The first step isn't to rebuild the wall. The first step is to weep for the reason that the walls are down. That's the first step. In other words, it's not enough to recognize there's a problem. To, to really be used by God, you must personally feel the weight of the need in your own heart. That's why you find this reference. It's strange to us. All through the Old Testament, people praying with sackcloth and ashes. That's what that's about. Notice those words, the verbs, sat down, wept mourned, fasted, prayed. And, 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 and I think, forgive me, but I think here you might see the secret to why many of us churchgoers today don't pursue holiness with the kind of zeal and passion that we should. Certainly, we have enough Bibles. We got them everywhere. We know the rules. We know the songs about holiness. We sing them all the time. We like the idea of holiness, but... That's not the same as taking the time we used to call it when I was growing up, waiting on God. First of all, feeling the weight, the burden of unholiness before you start to pursue holiness. Because only a fresh revelation of unholiness brings a fresh zeal for holiness, the seriousness of sin. I grew up in an era where every Sunday night, maybe some of you did, I grew up in Old Elam Tabernacle, Idlewild Drive and 25th Street in Saskatoon. My dad would preach and every Sunday night with a pretty full church, everybody at the close of the service as the hymn was sung, would go downstairs into what we called the prayer room. And virtually nobody went home Sunday night until you went for 10 or 15 minutes. You went down, there are green prayer mats. Anybody remember these things? Is it just me? There was a stacking chair, it was kind of in rows. It wasn't very spiffy, it wasn't very organized. And you'd go down there, little kids would go with their parents, and I don't know how much they prayed, but they, they knew the routine. You put the prayer mat on the linoleum floor because it was hard. You'd kneel down, you'd stick your head in that, and you'd pray about what you just heard in the sun. For how long did Nehemiah do this? Well, verse 4 just says, for days. But there are some clues in the text. He did this from the month of Kislev, chapter 1, verse 1, to the month of Nisan, chapter 2, verse 1. That's about five months. Think about that. Nehemiah sits, mourns, weps, fasted, prays 
for half a year when he hears the news. I mean, how easy it is eh, to take a totally different response. The walls are down. Who's responsible? What were those 50,000 Jews doing that went down there about this situation? Who's to blame? Organize a work crew, draft some drawings, prepare some preliminary budgets, get the buckets and mortar, organize some teams. Let's go. No. Oh, God. <laughs> Six months. What have we done? Just feeling that burden. It looked like nothing was happening for five months. Why not just start building? Because dependence upon God, real dependence upon God, not just wanting a fix to my problem, but real Godward dependence isn't born in a hurry. We don't naturally lean into God when we're caught in a mess. It takes a certain time shift to desert our own pride and rebellion and self-pity and look at things in God's light. Okay, point number two. Bring your heart to God with full confidence in his love and power. Here, here's what it takes five months. It takes five months for Nehemiah to learn to say this from his heart. It's in verse five of chapter one. And I said, after all this praying, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. What a great example of how to face a crisis. It's not just a weak, panicky shriek for help. There's wisdom here. This is going to be a big job. It's going to take long-term commitment. And, and the key to Nehemiah's success can easily be missed. He's not just looking for a solution to his problem. Those five months of, of uh, tear-filled praying, they changed his heart. We're, we're, not, we're not even starting with the walls, God. Let's start with you, your covenant, your faithfulness. Your love. I might not have the whole picture right now. There are things I don't fully realize right now. I might not be sure how to get out of whatever mess I'm in right now. But I'm going to start with what I am sure of. Your covenant, your faithfulness, your presence. Point number three. As he thinks of God's commands, verse 5, he thinks of the people's sin, verse 6. Notice, no direct work on the walls has taken place yet. Nehemiah 1, 5 and 6, And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant, that's Nehemiah, that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. So, like a lot of our problems, Nehemiah recognizes Nothing is going to be fixed properly with unconfessed sin at the root of everything. Nothing's going to be fixed. There are therapies, there are ideas, there are self-help books. You can get anything you want in almost any church you want. Nothing is going to be rebuilt in Don Horbin's life until he gets on his face and recognizes, I've sinned. Here's the problem. <laughs> the problem is you're holy and I'm self-willed. And so Nehemiah recognizes this. He prays, confesses the sins of the people, and notice he also includes himself in it. Any Jewish person would mourn the broken walls around Jerusalem. 
They all of them hated that. Nobody likes to live with brokenness in any area of life. And it's easy to mourn when the walls are down. Christian people can get serious about God all the time. Their rebellion, their stubbornness have gotten them into a bad place. But Nehemiah's doing something different here. Here's Nehemiah with all the people. And, he's, and as he prays, he leads the people to see not that the walls are down, but why the walls are down. Don't just cry about brokenness. Repent for the source of brokenness. Here's why. Because until this process is thought through, until the real source of the problem is rooted up, confessed, forsaken, any repair job on the walls is just going to be temporary until they make the same mistake again. easy to rebuild walls. It's much more difficult to root out idolatry. That's what they were dealing with. Rebellion, unfaithfulness, disobedience. So remember, Nehemiah, he searches his heart on behalf of the people, too, for five months. Because he knows they want the walls up. He's not sure they want to please the Lord. It's not always easy to pray like that. It takes wisdom, discernment to see beyond the apparent pain of broken circumstances, however they manifest themselves, to see past that into the responsive heart to God, what God wants, how I can yield to his ways and ignore some of the impulses that might creep up really quick in anger or self-pity to the surface of my life and not to respond to those things, but to be in touch with God. It's hard. It's hard. I'm not saying God is loveless or stern or just trying to rub our face in our failures. That, that's not the point. That's not the point. God's not like that. The point here is seeing the reasons behind the brokenness so that we'll be delivered from repeating the same mistakes down the road. The real issue is this. I wonder how many times any given set of painful situations that I come scrambling to Father God with could have been avoided altogether if earlier, instead of being self-willed, I had been listening to God when he spoke. But I didn't see the importance of it then. And then all of a sudden, the damage done by those things starts to manifest in pain to my life. And now I cry out to the Lord and say, how come you didn't help me? If I don't learn to trace the brokenness in my life back to earlier points of neglect or disobedience, I will never gain a heart of wisdom to avoid making the same blunders again in the future. That's the point. That's the point of connection between Nehemiah confessing the sin of the people, not just, we got to build the walls. Four. You still okay? I'm not sensing exuberance there. Okay, we're almost done. Four. So this discernment that Nehemiah has, where did that come from? Why does he see things, the real situation, that others are missing? Verses 7 to 9 of chapter 1. He says, we've acted very corruptly against you and haven't kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, if you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. They're just coming out of Babylonian captivity. I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me, keep my commandments, do them. Though you are dispersed under the farthest skies, I will regather them from there, bring them to the place I have chosen to make my name dwell there. So here's the important question. 
Why did Nehemiah pray with discernment while others couldn't see what was really going on with these broken walls? And the thing is, in Nehemiah's prayer, there are no less than seven direct quotations from the then Bible, the Old Testament. So his prayer, remember that five months? His prayer is soaked in hours of study and reverence before the revealed will of God. And he sees, he sees the big picture, the big plan. He sees why they're there. He sees the importance of returning to the Lord. He sees what God promised to do if they return to the Lord. And here's a life lesson. Here's a life lesson for everybody, okay? It's this. We don't always see the value of Bible study immediately when we're reading it. Nehemiah spends five months praying, mourning, fasting, studying, praying. But when he gets to looking at the walls, he, he knows why the walls are down. He knows what the problem is. He knows what God promised. There's such wisdom here. This is not just some emotional maniac screaming out, oh, revive us, oh God. This is a man of God whose heart and mind are full of the word, who's being gripped by the Holy Spirit as he looks at the people, the nation, and he says, oh, here's where we've gone wrong. Here's the root of the problem. God, you said this, and we've done that. How could we possibly think this was going to work? That's what's going on here. Five. The work on the walls goes well because Nehemiah starts the whole program off on the right foot. Waiting on God is never wasted time, even if you have to wait in humble confession and mourning for five months. It's never a waste of time. As Nehemiah prays and as he seeks God, a plan starts to form in his mind. Now, the plan will make the whole building process a great success, but the actual construction process doesn't begin with stones and mortar. The process begins on Nehemiah's knees in prayer. He gets God's wisdom. Now. In the next few chapters, you're going to see it. Dangers. God's going to show Nehemiah dangers and hurdles and problems before Nehemiah even gets there because he's open and pure and repentant and humble before God. Sooner or later, sooner or later, all of us in different areas are going to go to God, not in a particular time of fruitfulness and blessing, but in a time where we're shoveling rubble around in our lives. And some of these lessons from Nehemiah can be life-changing if you hold them intact and remember them deep in your heart. So be at prayer about these next few Sunday nights that God will speak to all of us. Rebuilding our lives in times of rubble because sooner or later, there's not one person in this room that's not going to need it.